Good morning and welcome to 2024. Now for the last two or three years I've been trying to get into woodwork but um, haven't had the space to do it. Well I now have, having recently moved house, I now have a garage. So hopefully I can make something of it um, rather than just a mess. Now one of the things I've become interested in the last three years or so is, uh, this will sound daft, walking stick making. Um, or rather, I probably should say shillelagh making. But why would anyone want to make a walking stick, I sense you wondering. Well, it's a bit of a dying art now, but many people in the past would have had a stick of some sort, whether it be a walking aid or a status symbol. Since the advent of cars, people walk less, so don't need them as much. Perhaps you have an elderly or disabled friend or relative who needs a walking aid, such as this one I made my grandmother a couple of years ago. Our dear old queen was seen leaning on an antler-topped stick the last time we saw her just two days before she passed away. Perhaps you're into hill walking and need a hiking stick to help you up Mount Snowdon, Mount Fuji or Mount Doom. What do you mean Mount Doom isn't a real place? A relatively common thing in the past seems to be using a walking stick to show off something or make a talking point. Think of John Hammond in Jurassic Park with his mosquito in amber. In Tangmere Museum there's a display of sticks dating from the First World War. One is made from the wood of a downed zeppelin, another has a handle made from a smoking pipe on which a pilot has made a cross for each enemy he shot down. Or maybe it's something very unusual like this one I found in an antique shop which is made from a shark's backbone. Maybe you're into cosplay and need a stick as a prop. Maybe you're into vintage fashion and need one as an accessory. Carrying a walking stick in Victorian times appears to have been a bit of a status symbol such as this famous photo of rich kids versus poor kids. I can think of a few occasions in fiction, for example, where a walking stick is a sort of concealed carry weapon. I'm thinking of Lucius Malfoy's wand, Dr. Watson's hidden sword, and of course Gandalf's staff when he drives out Wormtongue. My grandfather once owned a stick that concealed a very thin hip flask. Perhaps rather than hide a weapon, the stick itself could be a weapon. At the end of the Victorian era, there was a strange martial art called Bartitsu, which used a walking stick as a method of self-defence. Perhaps most famously, the Irish shillelagh has been used as a weapon and status symbol in faction fights. My great-grandfather was a little Irishman who had a large shillelagh slash cudgel, so my interest in the craft stems from that. And now back to me in the garden where I'll show you what to look for when you're out stick hunting. What I'm actually going to do today is show you how to look for, because I now have a very long garden with a hedge and lots of trees, I'm going to um, show a few ways of looking for sticks, the right sort of stick. So step one, sourcing your stick. So some of the things you will end up with, or some of the things you're looking for, looking to, looking to end up with I should say, is like this. So that is a large chunky piece of blackthorn, it is just a bit thinner than my wrist. Um, those are three bits of hawthorn. Now some people struggle to tell the difference when they're growing. Um, as you can see here, hawthorn is a bit greyer and sort of feels feels a bit like, well, a bit like the rock wall, the stone wall that it's leaning up against. Um, looks a bit like it as well. Blackthorn I always think feels a bit like rusty metal. Um, this is cracked, we'll come back to cracking in a minute. Smaller things, so, I mean look at the shape of that, that is a natural growth. So it's grown with a perfect handle, and these two have um, perfect little bits for your thumb. It's a nice little thumb stick. Um, that one will need a hell of a lot of straightening, but we'll come to that later in part two. Um, let's move on to a couple of bits of hazel. If you're only making a cudgel, this is sort of ideal. Sort of give you an idea of the size of it compared to my hand. It's quite light. This was growing on the tree, um, a tree at my uh, allotment actually. So it's sort of growing on the tree like that. Someone had already cut that end off and it made a perfect sort of small cudgel. That's a piece of hazel that I cut off close to the ground. Ideally I probably could have cut it closer to the ground than that, but that should have enough to work with. Um, 
here's another little thumbstick. That is a uh, piece of lilac that somebody was um, throwing out. They were advertising, you know, marketplace, free wood, free to collector. Um, they'd actually cut down a twisted willow as well, which is what I had gone for. I spotted this in a big heap underneath and went, ooh, I'll have that. Here's another one, slightly obscure this one. This is actually fire form, um, or pyracantha. Um, I was going to say it's not native to Britain. It's not a native hedgerow like blackthorn and hawthorn, but grows very similar. And that was from my old garden, um, garden hedge. And if you're really lucky, sometimes you'll get to take down a whole tree. Um, obviously get permission first. Quite often there's people saying, need to get a tree gone, free to collector, etc. Collector must cut down, that sort of thing. So this is a big piece of holly, and the same with this one. This one's a piece of massive piece of birch. Again, can't get the camera far enough to wait. That's a good chunky piece. So that's kind of what you're looking for, and then you just get straight pieces like this. So again, this is um, yeah. There's a few just straight pieces like that, straight bog standard hiking sticks. This is um, a bit of holly, uh, that is a piece of blackthorn, and these two are birch, I believe. Probably from the same tree I got that one. So that's the sort of um, the blanks you're hoping to end up with. As I say, sometimes you can get multiple bits from multiple, multiple bits from one tree or one branch. Um, down here I've laid out a piece of, or rather three pieces, of blackthorn. This was growing on my allotment, so I cut this about three years ago. It's definitely time to start working on it. So you can see branch here. Da, 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 da. This piece is slightly thicker than my thumb. That's about where you want to start. And you want a piece down here sort of an inch, inch and a half. If you get start getting any thicker than that, it will um, most likely start to crack in the seasoning process. We'll come back to that. So here we have three, three bits, you could say three styles, all from the same piece of wood. So this one, so you can see the join here. It's basically where a thin bit joins the thick bit, the main trunk or a thick branch. And I've made a cut there. So that will become a um, cudgel. I'll round off the edges. This, duh, 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 relatively straight piece and quite thick. Again, out, there's a thistle underneath that. Compared to my thumb, it's about twice the thickness of my thumb. That will become a, uh, a walking stick slash cudgel. I will smooth, probably take that end off there, smooth this, round this into the handle. And then the end of this was this piece. Very long, thin, Again, this is about the thickness of my thumb, and I've got quite small hands. So I had intended this to be another piece with a handle. It might still make it, but as you can see, it actually, the bark split when I cut it. Um, so I may just take that off, but it's quite a long piece. It would actually do, the top of it comes to my chest. And that's when it's still slightly bent. So actually that could be a hiking stick as well. So there you go. Three sticks from effectively one branch. So now we will move on to the sort of things you're looking for when uh, stick hunting as it were. So this is, a, this is a hazel tree, by far one of the most common trees that stick makers use because it grows in this sort of multi-trunk fashion. This one's got uh, five, five trunks across there, um, and it will go a certain distance, and it will branch out, and, it, and those branches will branch out. It sounds daft, but they sort of grow in this very sort of lots of trunks, quite straight upwards, which is why it's favoured by a lot of stick makers. Now the piece I'm looking at is this piece here, which is quite straight and thick, and goes meets to a, a decent joint, decent thick joint there. We probably make use of 
the bit above it as well. And what we will do is we will cut it there and there. You want a couple of inches either side of the bit you want to keep. And then planning for the future, you can see here a couple of bits. Um, this is almost thick enough. I might, I'll probably leave this another year. Um, but I've got a choice of two here, where they both join. You can see someone's cut this off already, possibly doing the same thing. But yeah, so there's a join, and there's a join. So I've got choices of two, and that will probably be in next year's harvest. Yeah, again, quite, quite straight. Decent handle at the end. That's the sort of thing you're looking for. I'm going to go for a wander down the garden and see what else I can spot. Come with me. So I'm quite fortunate to have a um, quite a long actually. All the way, all the way down. You see lots of nice straight bits coming out. Again, mostly hazel, but there is some hawthorn, holly, woods that you can use. Uh, any hardwood is um, is good. Uh, softwood I wouldn't bother with. Really, the only softwood I might be tempted with is um, you. Very hard. <laughs> it's a very hard softwood. Most of this is hazel. Um, this chunky bit here is either beech or hornbeam. I'm tempted to say beech because there's a lot of beech trees around here. Beech is again very good. Um, but again, hazel is quite often what I'm looking for. Um, there's a big, ah, so there's a big hawthorn tree here. Big hawthorn tree. Now, if I was going to cut down the whole tree, that would make a hell of a club at the end. Um, but again, it would probably crack in the seasoning process. I'm filming this in January. That's the um, leftovers of, a, of pumpkins from Halloween. That would be quite a good joint there. Get your little handle from that, and there's your shank. Um, I think the uh, the wife might get annoyed if I cut down an entire hawthorn tree. It would be fine. The tree itself would be fine. It would grow back. Hawthorn, blackthorn, hazel. These sort of hedgerow trees they don't do they don't actually do too well if you let them grow quite large. And that's sort of what you want for this sort of thing is smallish but tough wood. Hazel, blackthorn, hawthorn, holly. Um, oak and ash are fine. Blackthorn is the favoured for... Some people say a, a true Irish shillelagh has to be made of blackthorn. Some people will say it has to be oak or blackthorn. My grandfather worked with wood his whole life, and he said you can't beat a good bit of ash. A few long, thin... So that one there would make a good sort of hiking stick. Just a single straight piece. Again, more hazel. Lots of straight bits in there. Ah! Now... At the back there, there's a very tall piece of sycamore that I've had my eye on for a while. I think I'll cut that today as well. The um, the wife wants a, uh, it's like, this is going to be like a very long thumb stick, it's going to be a washing line prop. So, bits you want to avoid. In cutting bits out of your hedge, live bits, you can also remove dead bits. Because you don't want to remove all of it, because there's all sorts of um, small creatures that depend on it. But anything that's like sort of hollowed out, green inside, hollow, um, dry, make quite good kindling for the fire. Um, something you also want to avoid is, I don't know what fungus this is, but um, it only seems to grow on the dead stuff. So avoid bits like that. That's uh, 
some of the things you look for, long straight bits, even if they're slightly bent, you can uh, straighten them later. We'll come to that. So that was step one, sourcing your sticks. Step two, cutting. Okay, so this is the piece, uh, first piece I'm going to cut. We're back to the hazel in the front garden. And you want to leave a good two or three inches top and bottom above around the bit you want to keep you want to save this bit something might happen to this it might get it might crack uh, might get dented uh, might even get woodworm that sort of thing I have an issue with woodworm in the garage which is going to be fun so yes I'm going to cut it sort of about there and about there I'm not using a chainsaw, one of my neighbours is. Um, I'm just using a pruning saw. Not as rusty as it looks. So take the top off, lower the, lower the weight. The overall weight of what you're going to cut. And there we have it. So, that will be the handle with the shank going that way. And now I'm just going to cut off these twigs. That was relatively easy because that was a single sort of specimen plant um, tree. Uh, if you're in a thicket or a woodland, it might be a lot denser, particularly um, blackthorn, for example, likes to grow lots of stems really close together, all with vicious thorns on. If you go anywhere near a blackthorn, have some um, eye and um, hand protection because if you get one of those in your hand it really hurts. I got a couple of years ago I got a fire thorn thorn went through my glove into my middle finger and I could feel it for about a year. Um, because what happens is a lot of bacteria on the tip of the thorns and it gets infected. Um, if you are tackling something spiky then you might want to take the work out which bit you want to keep and then take off the extra twiggy bits. Uh, take those off first. And none of this will get wasted. I'll dry the kindling, uh, dry the twigs, and use it for kindling. Right. I would normally lay this on the ground to do it, but because I'm trying to show you, I'm trying to stand this up. So what I'm going to do is work out what height I want to keep what height I want to take this off at. So it's quite straight, quite straight to there. You see the handle I want, the bit that I really want is on the ground at the moment. It's all this up to here, and then you've got this sort of dog leg. That's the handle bit I want to keep. It's quite straight, quite straight, until you get to this bit here, where it's a sort of new bit of growth, as it were. Um, that is called a dog leg. That will not straighten, certainly not very easily. You have to, to get that to match, you have to bend this. But this is already at least four feet tall up to there, which is fine. I'm cutting above the dog leg because that then gives me the dog leg bit um, as um, redundancy. And I'm just going to take that off just there. Okay. And this is what I'm left with. That already actually is quite a good. I could leave that as it is, height-wise. Um, I might do, I might lower it, might take it a bit lower. Um, there's all sorts of different ideas on the right height for a walking stick. I know one particular Irish stick maker says um, it's half your height with shoes on. Um, that is for a walking stick that you might lean on, like really lean on down, sort of, to me down that sort of height. Um, I tend to prefer something a bit higher up um, if, you, if you are making a thumb stick, a thumb stick wants to be a, somewhere between sort of shoulder and armpit height. Um, one of the ideas of a thumb stick, one of the things I've seen is you can lean on it 
like that. Um, so you're at a Marquis or something. I said about redundancy. Um, really dense wood, your oak, your ash, apple, pear, um, blackthorn, blackthorn and plum. Members of the prunus, not so much cherry, but um, blackthorn and plum really crack really badly. Two bits of blackthorn, these are the bits from the, the three bits that came from the same tree. So the thick ends, the really thick ends, you will see develop these little cracks. Um, and if it gets really bad, it starts splitting up the wood. This is why you leave a few inches of redundancy so that this bit can crack, that bit can crack, but the bit you want in the middle doesn't. Um, some people, a lot of people, especially with blackthorn, will say put uh, wax or paint seal the ends is what you will see people saying a lot um, i've had reasonable success without sealing the ends um, some people swear by it just some melted wax candle wax or something dip your dip the ends in it basically any any of these cut ends they say you know, dip it in dip it in hang it up and um, let's clean them that doesn't always work here is a really large piece of blackthorn that I cut. Uh, could be early this, no, <laughs> early this year, now 2024. Early 2023, I think I cut this. And it was stored in my log shed with a load of other um, sticks, oak, holly, apple, willow, sycamore, uh, yeah, and other bits of blackthorn including those bits you, I've just shown you. Um, and this has cracked horrendously. It, I mean, obviously the cut wasn't very straight. It was quite difficult to get to. But it's gone right down there. Um, so as well as each cut end, I should have cut that a lot smoother, but it's cracked really badly there. Uh, that end, yeah, so the foot end, you can see is cracked there and up there. Um, but the worst thing about it, is it's actually cracked inside. So even if I'd sealed the ends, the sides have cracked and split. Um, and it's really bad, really, really bad. Um, I mean, I could fill the cracks in. Um, I don't know. I'll come back to it. What are my neighbors using a chainsaw? Um, I'll, pro I'll come back to that in a year or two and see what it, see what I think. Today's hazel. Um, so once you've got your bit cut to the length you want, this is probably far longer than I want it, um, or will want it. Um, you've got your redundancy, you can wax paint the ends if you want. Um, I'm not going to. Reasonable success without it. That's why I build in the redundancy. Um, label it. Put a label on this thing because you will forget what it is. Um, I did put labels on. Now, here's a bunch from earlier. Um, so, as you can see, there's a label, so it's holly. I cut it April uh, 2021. I put its weight and then how long to season it for. Um, right, so we'll break that down. The date you cut it, you want to put on, you want to make a note of because that tells you when it's ready to use, uh, when it should be ready to use, and the weight. Sounds odd, but you're seasoning it. Uh, you are letting it dry out. It's living wood is full of sap and moisture and all sorts. Uh, what you want to do is cure it. You're not like bleeding it out. Um, you just want it to sort of dry and harden within the wood. 
um, which is why some people say to seal it because it keeps all the moisture in, keeps its strength. Um, the so you, you make a note of the date. The rule of thumb: you season the wood for approximately one year for every inch of thickness at the thickest point. So the thickest point here is about three inches, two to three inches. So this is two to three years um, of seasoning here. So I cut this in we're on the 1st of January 2024. I won't even look at this until January 2026. Okay. So one way to see when it's finished seasoning is to weigh it. Um, luggage scales I find the best. Um, if you are like me and you haven't long moved house and you can't find your luggage scales, then the kitchen scales will do. Not that I ever use the kitchen scales. Um, so this was uh, 1,050 kilos. Sorry, <laughs> 1,050 kilos. 1,050 grams, so just over a kilo in weight. Um, about the same as a, just over a bag of sugar. That will lose a hell of a lot of its weight. Probably about a third of that will go at least um, in the moisture content. Um, so I'm going to label it. What I usually use for labels, you can use those luggage, uh, luggage labels, <sighs> present labels, that sort of thing. What I normally use is bits of old card. So that was a fire lighter box. Just a cardboard, piece of cardboard, piece of string. Um, so that was a piece of fire thorn I cut in 29th of November 2021. What I've got lying around, because we just had Christmas, is a Terry's chocolate orange. Um, what I will do is take the lid off, cut it in half, and there's a label. Talk amongst yourselves. Doesn't have to be anything special. Um, and when I started doing this, I was using regular cardboard and string. Um, the issue I had is I was storing it in an outdoor woodshed, um, which had rodents in. Um, voles, mice, that sort of thing. We didn't see any rats, we saw voles and mice. Um, and natural string, especially uh, hessian twine sort of thing, they absolutely loved it for some reason, and they ate through all the string, and all my labels fell off, and that's why I have a whole load of sticks scattered around that I can't remember what all of them are, or what they weighed, or anything like that. Um, so the weight thing is, you can, so, for example, weigh the stick when you cut it, and then weigh it in, say, three months' time, and that is most of its weight will have gone by then. Um, I should point out, you only cut sticks in the winter, because that's when the sap... Um, hasn't risen in the plant yet. It's got its uh, least amount of moisture in the wood. It's the most of the moisture is down in the roots. Um, if you cut it in the summer, for example, spring, summer, spring is when the sap's really rising. Summer, it's full. Autumn, it's starting to die down again. Winter, it's completely not completely gone, but it's at its lowest point. If you do cut in the summer, it can take up to half as long again. So. If I cut that in the summer, that wants two or three years anyway. It could be four or five years um, if I cut it in the summer. Uh, right, so I have my tag. Um, as I say, you can use string. I have taken to using green uh, gardener's wire. Anything like that will do. I do have some green string here. I think um, if you're hanging, if you're hanging it properly then string is okay. Um, so I'm going to write on this that it's hazel. I cut it on the 1th of the 1th, 24. Cut a piece of string. Um, for the seasoning part of this, if you're just doing one, if you're just making the one stick and it's going to be your stick, and family heirloom or whatever, um, hang it vertically uh, with the heaviest point down. 
um, because I find it, I, I believe the process is the being that the heaviest the the thickest bit at the bottom keeps the um, helps the wood stay as straight as it can um, because as it's drying the drying process is odd that's why it, it thicker woods crack because they're really dense and it's a bit like um, you know if you make a piece of paper wet it's then very difficult to get it completely smooth again completely dry again without really squashing it flat um, it's like yeah you, know, you make, make make a piece of paper wet it's all crinkly and it's it you know it stays like that once it's dried that's the sort of the drying process with wood it's lots it's that times a lot um, much thicker so hang it thickest side down um, just going to attach my label nothing fancy just tie a knot around the thickest end so there we go it's labeled and now I will wire it and hang it uh, heavy side down got a piece of wire from an old bunch um, if you're doing a bunch as I say like this bunch here if you're making a few you can tie them together in batches of about four or five any more than that they get a bit unwieldy and difficult to tie together another reason you leave excess bits at the bottom is you want something thick that you can grip that you, you can grip onto with your wire so for example I'm reusing a piece of wire normally I would cut a fresh piece for this but there we go that will hold that um, that means that the mice can't chew through it so you, uh, for, for seasoning you want something like um, so it wants lots of airflow it wants to be dry um, preferably very little sunlight so something like a log shed is ideal um, or in my case a very drafty garage that is the garage door you can see daylight around the um, frame so it's pretty drafty in here uh, so that should be suitable um, you do want a probably building without any woodworm this building has woodworm which I'm working on now then I'm just hanging mine from a nail on the wall and um, as I say that that's where it will stay for about two years the traditional uh, Irish method of seasoning wood to make your shillelagh or whatever was uh, to hang it inside the chimney breast um, a lot of uh, very early houses in Ireland were sort of stone um, huts uh, if I use the word hovel that sounds derogatory but that's sort of what they were very simple building um, and in the middle of these they often had a big stone chimney fireplace and they would hang their freshly cut blackthorn inside uh, the chimney one of the things they burnt on these fires was peat dried peat bog um, it's a sort of a mossy type material that goes uh, when dried it burns quite well um, lots of it in Ireland and some in Scotland as well and uh, they burn it on these fires and it produces a very sort of oily smoke um, obviously the heat from the fire sort of dries the wood out um, but there's a sort of oily smoke and I, I think that soaked into the wood um, a lot of modern blackthorn sticks are painted black um, or a very dark brown naturally it is a sort of dark brown to a purpley color actually blackthorn and um, I prefer that personally um, but the traditional blackthorns were made black by the soot from the chimneys in which they were hung um, and they'd hang them in there for a few years um, they'd soak up this sort of oily peaty smoke uh, the wood would harden and the the oil would sort of help cure the wood uh, when we get to the second stage of this you'll see me putting um, modern oils and things on it um, but uh, that'll be in a couple of months if you enjoyed the video don't forget to uh, leave a like and if you want to see the second part of this where I actually get down to the making of um, a walking stick a shillelagh whatever you want to call it um, then don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button for when part two comes out 
probably in a few months time once I've sorted out this mess. Bye.